All right, guys, we got a pretty cool interview today. I'm here with Ashton Bowers, who's going to go play the Australian Open, 2023 Australian Open Juniors. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Now, Ashton, before we get started, something completely off topic that I want your just no holds barred opinion on. You, you don't have to be nice to me, even though we just okay. I want to know what you think about this. Okay. Yesterday, I took a pickleball lesson. Okay. What do you think about that? Are you fine with that or are you a little offended? Is that right, wrong, or is it no big deal? What do you think? I don't think it's a big deal. I mean, I tried pickleball for the first time a few weeks ago, and it's totally different from tennis. It's really hard because the timing's different. Um, but I think it's like, it's a great sport. Oh, uh, look at that. She says it's a great sport. You guys, can't, let me know what you think. Are you mad at me? All right, let's, let's get in this interview. It's fine with Ashes, so that's cool. So I want to go, and first of all, how did you get in? What does it take to be playing in the Australian Open Junior Tournament? That's quite an achievement. It took a lot of hard work. I mean, I've been blessed with amazing coaches and amazing parents and such great hitting partners. So I feel like they've really helped me along the way. Um, just the resources that I've had have been really great. But what, what's the actual criteria? Like, what do you have to be ranked or win? Is it one specific tournament? Is it a certain ranking? What did you do? to be able to be invited to play there? Well, I believe I'm 68 in the world, and they take about, I think, a 64 draw. Mm -hmm. So the top 64 get to go to Australia, and then there's a qualifying draw, so some people can qualify to get in. But I had to win. I won two grade twos in November. What's a grade two? No one knows what a grade two is. It's an international junior tournament that's level two. They go one, two, three, four, five. Mm, and wow. a Grand Slam is a grade A. So you won two international tournaments? Two grade twos back to back, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And, and how do you start to play internationally? You know, when I was growing up, I played, you know, my section, my state, and I played nationals, never played ITF. So how do you figure out, like, how do you first of all figure out, like, I'm getting kind of good. I should, like, go big and go international. And then how do you get invited to these tournaments? Well, everybody kind of starts with the region. So I grew up in the Midwest, so I started with the Midwest, and then I played USCA tournaments. And I had a coach that was from Romania, and he kind of knew ITFs and kind of got me into that. And then once I started playing ITFs, I realized I needed to pick one or the other because it's hard to keep points in both. And then I just picked ITF, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> oh, cool. That is awesome. So what I really want to get into today so that everybody gets something out of this, we have a lot of adults who just are passionate. They love to play like you. They're jealous of you. I'm jealous of you too. Um, but yeah, they love to play like you. And, but they, they, even though they're adults and recreational players, they view themselves as like a serious junior. They want to be treated like a serious junior. So I want to get some kind of insight on how to get as much out of your game as possible, which, which you are. And then also for the juniors out there, who want to aspire to play like you, you know, what it actually takes. So I'd like to kind of go back to the beginning now okay. and then figure out how you ascended to this amazing level. So tell me about the first tennis ball you hit. Do you remember or what did your parents told you happened? Like when were you introduced to the game of tennis? So it was actually because I was watching my brother play a lesson. Mm -hmm. and I just got really jealous. I was like, oh, I can do this. I can beat him. Like, that's not, that's easy. Mm -hmm. And so my parents weren't actually there, um, but I just went out there, and I started playing, and my coach is like, man, like, like you can hit the ball. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> and it was, like, really fun because I was always trying to beat my brother, so he's been my competition for a while. Yeah, now tell everybody about your brother. Your brother's also an amazing player as well, playing yeah. pretty big-time college tennis. He goes to the University of Illinois, mm -hmm. and he's a freshman there this year, so he's mm -hmm. 20 years old, and yeah, he's really excited. Yeah, that's awesome. And what's his name? Tyler Bowers. Tyler Bowers, also a very good player. Now, you're seeing your brother out there. You go out on the court. How old's your brother, and how old are you when this happens? I think I was five, so my brother was probably seven. Your brother was seven? Mm. Okay, awesome. And so you play that first day, Yeah. and then... You come home, and obviously your parents probably heard from the coach, and you probably said, oh, you love it. 
did they put you in lessons right after that? Or did you just kind of have to get your brother's scraps? He'd, he'd take his lesson, then maybe somebody would mess around with you for a little bit. How did yeah. that happen? I got his scraps for a while. You got his for scraps. a few months. And then I started getting lessons, and it kind of just kept building. Um, but we shared the same coach, so I got his scraps for a while. Yeah, yeah. I think that if you notice, too, lots of times the younger one, just even though it looks like they start as a disadvantage because the older one's better for a while and, and the first, but I think there's something to having to watch that and then something to aspire to. Yeah. So how much of an inspiration has it been to kind of be trailing, watching your brother play and, and all that kind of stuff? It's been really helpful. I mean, honestly, I don't think I'd be where I am without him. I might not have even started tennis, and I can kind of learn from his mistakes and see what he does good. Um, so I really learned from him, and I look up to him. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And you two, you two get along now. I heard your brother said, like in the beginning, it wasn't always pretty, but now you two are kind of like yeah. buddies and supportive of each, of each other. Well, when we were younger, we were really competitive because we were both just starting tennis. But now that he's off to college and I'm kind of doing my own thing, we both respect each other and we get along really well. That is that is really awesome. How often will you two hit with each other? I mean, that's such an advantage to have somebody else in the house who can hit a sweet ball like the two of you can? Well, he just got back yesterday, so we hit together today, but obviously he needs to play with people that can push him like a lot. So we'll hit together if he's back maybe like once or twice a week. That's still pretty good. Okay, so you go out there starting to take lessons. When did you have it in your mind? In t if it was right away, tell me it's right away. When did you have in your mind, like, I want to be really good at this? Like, when I go to the court, I don't want to waste time and just kind of fool around. I will actually want to, like, master this game. Do you remember at what age that struck you in your, in your mind? I think I was 11 or 12 because I was still playing, like, soccer and basketball, and I kind of had to quit those sports. I think my dad had to talk with me, and I had to make a decision because – I was getting pretty good at tennis, and he wanted to make sure that's what I wanted to do. So I think I was 11 or 12, and I started doing really well in the Midwest tournaments. And I chose tennis, and then it kind of built from there. And then we moved to Atlanta three years ago, mm -hmm. so that really helped. Mm -hmm. Now, where in the Midwest were you playing? Um, I lived in Bloomington, Illinois, so I was playing pretty much all around. Like, we would go to Ohio a lot, Michigan a lot, um, Indiana. Mm -hmm. So... At 11, 12 years old, when, when you and your dad had the talk, what were you ranked in the state or section, or was there even a national ranking already at this point? I think it was like a Midwest ranking. Um, maybe like I was probably like top five in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And then nationally, I might have been around like 20. Nationally, you were 20 at 11. Okay, so... It just doesn't appeal to you when you're 20 in the nation, like, oh, I should start taking this serious. You, you already took it seriously if you were 20 in the nation at yeah. 11. So what age, we got to back that up, guys. <laughs> what age did you start to take, no one gets to 20 as this fooling around the nation. So yeah. what age were you, or, or, or maybe you don't even realize, like when you took lessons, was it always just like, hey, we're learning technique, we're, we're learning footwork, and you kind of right off the bat, we're learning how to play like an elite athlete? or, or you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like a lot of it was just learning technique. I mean, and there were so many other better players around that I don't think I put it into perspective that, okay, I was actually good because mm -hmm. I was always playing older kids. Mm -hmm. um, and there were still some pretty girl, good girls in my sections. So I don't think I put it into perspective sometimes. But I really like soccer because it was a team sport, but tennis teaches you so much more. Yeah. Okay, tennis teaches you so much more. Why do you think – tennis teaches you more than soccer what 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 did you mean by that like soccer if you're having a bad day coach can just pull you out and let the teammates handle it but tennis if you have a bad day that's on you like it's your responsibility so yeah yeah i i always have thought that that whether you're a junior like yourself or even an adult the people who are attracted to tennis it's it's a it's a different type of animal because what attracts most of us to tennis repels most people away from tennis. Like, oh, this is hard. This is frustrating. I'm, I'm mad at myself. I, <laughs> you know, like there's so much 
there's so many obstacles to being a, a tennis player. So um, why does that appeal to you? Like, you, you know, why do you like that frustration that maybe you don't have to get in a team sport where if you're having a bad day, you can kind of hide with other teammates doing things? What, what appeals to you about, hey, it's all on you? I think it's kind of just my personality. I mean, you can't really teach someone to be very competitive. It kind of just comes from them. So I really liked how if I had a good day, it was all on me. And if I had a bad day, it was all on me. Like, I didn't have to rely on saying, oh, we lost because of my teammate. Yeah, that's exactly why I picked tennis. You know, I, I 11, 12, I, was, I think I was number one in the state. And I had already made my decision, probably 10 going on to 11. Like, this is it. Like, I love this. And I love to play basketball and all other sports. But tennis was number one for me because I really loved the idea of, like, if I make a shot, I made the shot. If I miss a shot, I don't have to feel guilty or anybody. It's my, 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 <laughs> it's my issue. Okay, so um, one thing I, I help, uh, I, I was helping a high performance junior program here. And, you know, it's a lot of kind of getting onto the kids sometimes of like, you know, if you want to be as good as you can be, you're not doing the extra things to do that. You know, you're, you're, you're doing enough to be good, but not enough to be great. So at what age did you kind of have in your mind, like, I want to be great. I just don't want to be good. And I need to take things to the next level. Honestly, I think it was when we moved to Atlanta and I was again blessed with an amazing coach, Adina Galovitz. And she kind of showed me that there is so much more I need to learn, and there's still so much more I need to learn now. That when I started playing ITFs really competitively, I was like, man, like I want to be top in the world. So mm -hmm. it's just like that really put it into perspective for me. Like I really want to be great. Mm -hmm. So what is your what is your ultimate tennis dream? Do you have an ultimate specific tennis dream or a general tennis dream? Like what what would it be if like at the end of the day when the tennis it's kind of like not competitive anymore. What, what would you like to have accomplished? So I feel like for me, I mean, I've really surprised myself a lot. Like I never even thought I'd be playing ITFs, um, let alone making it to slams. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my goals was to make it to the slams. But now I really want to push myself to play professionally mm -hmm. and just see where it goes. Uh-huh. So, but I know there are a lot of other girls that have done it. Like, I know I can do it. Yeah. So. so to play at this high level that you're playing at, what is a typical training day? I assume you're homeschooled? I actually go in-person school. Okay. Yeah. And, and what are the hours on that? I go 8.30 to 12 or 1, depends on the day. Okay. So a little bit of an abbreviated day. So. Yeah. When would be the first time you train? Do you train before you go to school or do you train after everything after? Well, if I don't have like an exam that day, I'll go before and it's usually 6.30 to 8. 6.30 to 8. Is this court work? Is this, this uh, off court? Yeah. It's normally drill work, like mm -hmm. on court. Um, a lot of drills with like just, I hit with a lot of guys. So mm -hmm. there are some guys that go to school there, so I hit with them. And then I'll go to school, and some days I'll stay there, and I'll play like 1.30 to 4, and then do fitness after, mm -hmm. like 4 to 5. Um, and then some days I go to my coach, and we'll do like 1.30 to 3 with fitness after, or sometimes I'll do additional like playing points, like playing sets. Yeah. It just kind of depends on the day. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. I mean, that's a jam-packed day. Training 6.30 to 8. Going off to school, doing the school, and then basically it sounds like pretty much like 1.30 to about 6-ish or maybe even 7, training more, hitting more balls, getting your match play in, and then doing some fitness stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when is the day usually over for tennis? The day for tennis, it's about... I it's mean, probably, tennis and fitness. Tennis and fitness, it probably ends about 6. But then you got to go home and you got to do homework. Then you got to do homework. And shower and eat. And it's like 11 p.m. midnight and then you yeah. go to bed. Yeah. So it's jammed. Yeah. Um, so how do you keep the fire going to where you enjoy it? Do you, do you feel like you're 100% self-motivated or do sometimes your parents have to kind of get on you like, hey, 
you got to keep going or or is it just all within you to you're like i really don't need to tell me anybody to tell me of course you need motivation i mean you always need motivation you always need inspiration but do you feel like it's almost 100 percent internal like no this is my thing and i want to go after it every day um i feel like i've always had it in me to want to win because i've been super competitive but my dad has been a really big influence on me, and he's been on court with me probably millions of hours, feeding me balls, yelling at me. It's like mm -hmm. the same thing. So he's definitely – he pushes me all the time to be better, and my coach pushes me a lot, but my dad's been – he's been there the whole time. Yeah, I, I, I actually – you know, there's a lot of people who will kind of talk down on tennis parents, but I actually think it is necessary – to have somebody there also pushing you when you don't feel like doing it because if you want to make it you're, you're gonna need to do stuff sometimes you don't feel like it. especially when you're a kid you know you're like I want to be a kid today um, but if you're trying to be a professional you don't you don't have that luxury of, of time you know you've got to make the, the most of your time yeah. so and if you look at people who have accomplished a lot of great things in the game of tennis lots of times there's that parent who's kind of like we're, we're, we're doing this. Regardless if, if people view the parent as like too hard or too soft or whatever, there's always seems to be that, that one figure, whether it's a parent or a coach, like, no, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, Rafa had Uncle Tony. Yeah. Obviously, the Williams sisters had Richard. And, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, so here's a question I have for you. How often will you do stuff on your own? Like, if you notice – your serve is not working or something like that, there's a shot off, do you ever say to yourself, I'm going to go to the practice court and hit a bucket of serves on your own? Or is it just always structured? You just always do what's structured for the day? Or do you ever kind of go, I'm not doing this well. I need more of that. Of course. I mean, you have to be at this level. You have to put in the extra hours. Sometimes I'll even cancel a lesson because I'm like, no, I just need to work on this today. But a lot of times I need my dad's help, like if he's feeding yeah. me certain short balls. But if it's serving, I'll just go out to the park right by my house and just serve for however long I need to. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that kids watching this and adults, you know, adults who really want to, you, you can't just rely on the, the structure of what's given. You've got to also, you, you got to realize you're the architect of, of your game. You know, ultimately, you're your own CEO, and you you've got to know what you need. And and I feel, especially in junior tennis, there's too many kids who go, okay, I'm working pretty. This is again the difference between good and great. There's too many kids out there who go, okay, well, I am training this many hours, you know. But sometimes within a program, especially like I notice here, sometimes we're just hitting way more ground strokes uh, a certain week because we want to work on consistency, or we're we're doing more volleys. But you know, sometimes you're just not getting enough of something given what you're given in the structure, and you've got to realize that and go do it on your own. So I, th I think that that, that that is awesome. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about off-court fitness. What, what do you think is the most important thing to be working on to maintain your body, your fitness, your agility? Like, What are those workouts typically like? I think the biggest thing is stretching and recovery, which is something I need to work on so much better. I get yelled at all the time because I don't stretch after practice and then I'm sore the next day or tight. Um, so I think that's really helpful, but I think you need a mix of strength, conditioning, and then like agility. I think you rotate those in every week. Um, it kind of depends on the person too. Some Like you need muscle, but you also can't be too bulk because then mm -hmm. you can't get around the court. Mm -hmm. So just a good mix of that, I think would be really beneficial. Uh-huh, cool. I want to get your thought on this. So um, you know who Nick Boletari was? Yes, yeah. Okay, he, did, he, just, he just passed away. I got to interview him, and one of the questions from one of our, our, our people out there online was, you know, what do you think about technical cues as you're playing to help you make shots? And his answer was, because he obviously worked with a lot of people like yourself, his answer was, when you think you lose, like you've got to do all the work before the match, because uh, if you're out there thinking about your shot and, and giving yourself little tips, you know, like uh, that it's just, 
that you just can't automate and perform at a high level. Do you, do you agree with that? Or do you find yourself, you actually do give yourself little technical tips in a match? I think the best people don't have to think during the match. I mean, Federer doesn't think about his strokes. But I think during practice, you need to think about it and reinforce it. But once you get to a match, to hit it your best, you need to be just comfortable with it. Um, I mean, sometimes I still think about shots because I'm still technically working on my strokes. I'm still developing. But your best shots, you don't have to think about. So yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, th I think that, that that is the key. Is And certainly she'll have to think less than like a 3-5 player out there. Um, but I think that that is important. Even if you're a 3-5 player out there, it's like, She's still working on developing her strokes. She knows some strokes can get cleaner. And I don't think you ever stop, um, you know, obsessing about your technique and wanting to clean it up. And then, you, you know, you'll be super sharp. And then you feel like you lose that sharpness. So you got to kind of tweak it and get a little technical. But once you go out there and play, you, you can't be thinking too many technical things. So even if you are 3-5, wherever you're at, you're at for that day. And don't try and, you know, improve your technique during a match. Uh, play with what you have. And then notice what you're lacking and then go back and and work on that um all right i think we'll end it with this what is your what are some of your big your top three 2023 goals i would like to make a quarterfinal with slam that would be great um i would love to win a 15k just to start progressing pro tennis and it's a great question. It's my third one. I don't know. Well, the, I mean, those two are pretty good. Yeah. I think, again, like I just surprised myself. I just like going from there. I'm sure once I hit those goals, I'll have new goals. Uh -huh. so. Well, those are two very good goals. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, if you're watching this video and you haven't getting, given the video a like yet, what is wrong with you? Like this video. Root her on, wish her well at the Australian Open. So I want to see lots of comments with people rooting her well. Say, Ashton, good luck at the Australian Open. We'll be watching for, we'll be looking at those junior scores on ESPN and seeing how you did. I will as well. Thank you. And hopefully you'll come back. Maybe you want to do some videos with us. Maybe you can, yes. like, you can show people how you really hit a forehand, right? Because a lot of people just don't know how to hit that forehand <laughs> like you do, right? So um, good luck. Thank you. And we'll be watching you and rooting for you. Thank you. All right, guys. Take care and be ready for the next video.